Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Breakfast Club number eight. Uh, we're doing something different today, and it's pretty special. Uh, the Academy is obviously closed, but we are bringing one of the most magical pieces of it straight to you, and that is Morrison Planetarium. So to do that, we're welcoming the Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium, Ryan Wyatt. Hey, Ryan. Hello. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Um, Ryan's going to take you on a tour of the universe. He's going to pilot you through the cosmos, past all kinds of amazing things that are actually happening right now. And to do that, he's actually using the same software that we use in the dome. And when I first learned about this um, and about the dome itself, one of the things that um, I was most struck by was just how incredibly accurate it is. And uh, Ryan, I wonder if you would just tell people a little bit about what they're going to see and how that's possible. Absolutely. So the uh, software we're using, as you said, is the same software we use in Morrison Planetarium. It's kind of bespoke planetarium software. It's really yeah. only used by planetarium professionals and a few educators around the world. But it's it builds on video game technology. So using the, the best graphics. Now, my computer hasn't got the best gamer graphics card, but it's pretty good. And all of the data that astronomers have collected over the last several decades. So we're able to put together an accurate three-dimensional model of the universe. And in Morrison Planetarium, that covers about a 180 degrees field of view in a 75 foot dome, but we can also run it here on the screen and stream it to you live. So that's what we'll be seeing a little, little bit later. And like literally when people see, when, when you're in that view and you see this star is here and the star is over here and this one's here, that's really where, where they are, right? Exactly, and we're actually adding data to this all the time. In fact, I'll be showcasing in this uh, next sort of half hour, some of the most recent observations uh, and announcements from the last month. And so we bring data in from astronomers and scientists who contribute it uh, to sort of the, the global collection of astronomical data. And we can put that all in context with everything else that's in our three-dimensional model of the universe. That's so cool. Um, so the other thing I wanted to ask was just how you got started. And it made me think, like anytime I think about astronomy, I think about hearing that Walt Whitman poem when I was really young oh, yeah. about the learned astronomer. And even then I remember, and basically if you haven't heard this poem, it's he, Whitman is describing sitting there listening to an astronomer who's kind of breaking down how things work and why they work. And he gets really disillusioned with that and wanders out and looks up at the stars and that's much better for him. But even then I remember thinking like, I actually really like think it's extra beautiful to know how something works. Yeah. And so, yeah, I wanted to ask how you got interested in space and astronomy. Well, interestingly, I actually, and in perfect for my, my current career path, I actually got interested in a planetarium. I grew up in Northern Indiana, and when I was about seven years old, uh, my family and I visited Adler Planetarium in Chicago. And um, it was actually, it was a sort of mystical and kind of existentially terrifying experience. I learned that the <laughs> sun was not gonna live forever, and that really stuck Ooh. with me. Yeah. But also this just this huge space and and at the time the giant mechanical device in the center of the room which was also kind of terrifying uh is what really initially ignited my interest mm -hmm. uh and then uh, i continued i mean cosmos uh carl Sagan's cosmos was a big influence on me yeah. as well and i think that was interesting to me because kind of on the on the walt whitman front it put astronomy into this context of human discovery and and human knowledge so it became much more about the historical context and all of this. And, and it inspired me to study astronomy in, uh, as an undergraduate, grad school. Uh, but at that point, I have to say, I, I typically explain that I, I blame Hubble, Space Telescope, <laughs> for um, getting out of research astronomy. I was working with early Hubble Space Telescope data, and the first few sets of data were um, marred by the flaw in the mirror right. uh, of the Hubble. And, uh, and so the particular project that we were supposed to do just wasn't really possible mm -hmm. uh, with the data. So uh, it turns out that um, I was much more interested in education. And so I took my my love of the of bringing data uh, into um, uh, into planetariums uh, and have been doing that in various places uh, around the country since. So uh, it's been great to, uh, to kind of bring that research component. And like you said, building this um, three-dimensional atlas yeah. of the universe is something that we've really done collectively as a community over the last couple decades. And so it's been really awesome to be part of that. Yeah. And that the scary thing you talk about seeing in the middle of Alder, that was their their old star projector at the time, right? Correct. Yeah. So that was yeah. a traditional um, optomechanical star projector, a big metal object with lots of lenses to protect the stars. Yeah. And we've gotten rid of that in the modern Morrison planetarium. We actually have an amazing instrument that was built here in San Francisco, it was in the original Morrison, 
Uh, but now we use video projectors and we're able to cover the dome with a seamless image that isn't just the night sky. We can do an okay night sky, but it is this three-dimensional model of the universe, which for me is ultimately much more compelling because that's where the real stories in astronomy are. I yeah. love the historical aspect and, and cultural aspect of, of night sky astronomy. But what's really exciting is 21st century astronomy. And we can yeah. talk about that using these tools. Okay, well, that's a perfect segue. Uh, well done. <laughs> I'll just remind people before handing it over that you can ask questions for Ryan anytime at all just by leaving them in the comments section. And that can be about what he talks about today or it also can just be about astronomy happenings or the dome itself or anything related to his field. So Ryan, thank you so much again for joining us and we'll see you after. Sounds great, yes. So we're gonna switch over to a view of just the software will allow you to get a better sense of what's, what's happening uh, as, uh, as I'm talking about what I'm talking about. And so we're gonna begin our program here with a view of the International Space Station. And I think it's kind of neat to think about the International Space Station, not only as this statement about the international collaboration that astronomy represents, uh, but also, and this is really critical as we think about the, the ideas that we're gonna cover in today's presentation, the scale of the universe. So this is, a human scale in more ways than one. First of all, it's about the size of a football field from one end to the other. And there are, of course, people on board. So you can imagine what it might be like to be in the rather crowded and isolated conditions. In fact, our current condition, probably more than ever, uh, I can imagine what it's like for space, uh, for astronauts to, um, to live in those conditions. And, uh, and in fact, a few of the astronauts who spent time on the ISS uh, have talked about how they think their experience can translate into what a lot of people are now uh, thinking about in terms of the social kind of isolation that we're all experiencing. And of course, at least we can go outside and that's not really an option for astronauts in the uh, International Space Station. The other thing though is that this is as far as humans travel out into space these days. And it's a few hundred kilometers above Earth, a few hundred miles if you wanna think in those terms. And I actually started us, um, I actually backed up time about 20 minutes because I wanted to start us here, uh, the streak of white that you see crossing from the lower right-hand part of the screen to the upper left is uh, the Andes, uh, the mountain chain along the west coast of South America. And we're actually looking kind of off toward Tierra del Fuego. Uh, but to the right-hand side of the image and just kind of disappearing off to the right is the country Chile, which is actually one of the most important countries for astronomical research. And We've actually, our production team has had the good fortune to spend some time in Chile and we'll be releasing a show in September about astronomy in Chile called Big Astronomy. Uh, I'll be sharing a little bit more about that and my notes to this presentation, which we'll share a link to later. But I just wanted to point out Chile because one of the discoveries that I'll mention is coming from Chile and from an instrument uh, at a telescope there. But as I mentioned, and uh, I should have noted at points, you're gonna see my cursor here. I need to put the cursor up to pilot around my three-dimensional model of the universe here. So uh, once in a while, you're gonna see it uh, appear and I'll try to use it to point things out as well. But I'm gonna actually pull away from our International Space Station. And it looks like it's kind of plummeting into South America. That's not the case. It's just that we're pulling farther and farther away. We're gonna add the trajectory of the ISS, uh, its path around the Earth and that will allow us to see, again, how far humans travel into space, a few hundred kilometers above Earth. Now, that's not very far. Space, as it turns out, is pretty big, and humans actually haven't traveled all that far out into the regions of space. The line that's appearing now crossing the screen is sort of starting to disappear for a moment, uh, is the orbit of Earth's moon. So you can see the moon here, that is the closest astronomical object to Earth. It's about 400,000 kilometers or about 240,000 miles away. And that's a pretty uh, long distance. If you can imagine, um, maybe if you own a car, if you drive it for years and years, you might put 240,000 miles on it. Um, astronauts actually took about four days to traverse that distance from Earth to the moon but this is a tiny distance compared to some of the distances we'll be talking about in the program. So I want to mention a, a yardstick that I'll be using throughout the presentation, and that is light travel time. So light travels at a constant speed in the vacuum of space, about 186,000 miles per second, 
of 300,000 kilometers per second. That means it crosses this distance from Earth to the moon in a little less than a second and a half. So if you want to think about that, that's kind of like a pause in conversation. And as we pull farther from home, farther away from Earth, uh, we'll see the orbit of Earth around the sun. And then I want to pull far enough away so that we see the orbits of the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then Mars, as well as in the distance, the uh, orbits of the outer planets. And then just point out that we can use light travel time as a sense of scale in this image as well. The distance from Earth to the sun is about eight and a half light minutes. So it takes light about eight and a half minutes to travel from the sun to Earth. So that means that when you look at the full moon, you're seeing it as it was a second and a half ago, kind of a quick pause in conversation as mentioned. And when you look at the sun, not directly, always with eye protection, you're seeing it as it was about eight and a half minutes ago. You can think of that as a quick lunch or when I deliver this at nightlife, I talk about it, maybe a quick drink at nightlife. The uh, solar system though, contains a lot of objects other than uh, just the planets. As I said, we're looking at um, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the four inner planets here. I actually wanted to mention a visitor that we have to this part of the solar system. Uh, it's a comet uh, that goes by uh, 2019Y4, uh, or, oops, I actually didn't mean to do that. Um, but uh, the... Uh, this is a great way of emphasizing that this is a live presentation. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to just sort of move things around to get a view of, um, of our comet. Uh, and this is actually, um, I'm gonna now speed up time to see the trajectory of this comet. Um, this is actually, um, we've kind of backed up time so that uh, we're seeing the comet where it was a, uh, a couple of years ago, um, but, um, I'm gonna actually speed things up so that we can watch in its approach as it gets closer to uh, the sun. So uh, let's go ahead and I'm gonna adjust our um, uh, speed so that we're watching in sort of days per second. Uh, and as we do, you'll notice first of all where this object came from. Uh, it's coming from the outer solar system. So I mentioned uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars uh, in close to the sun. You have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the outer planets farther away. This object came from much farther out in the solar system. We'll be talking about some discoveries of such objects uh, in uh, uh, a little bit later. Now, what you can actually see as we rotate around in 3D is that in fact, the trajectory is kind of bent. It's being um, pulled by the gravitational uh, influence of the of the sun, and it is uh, uh, as it gets closer to the sun, is kind of following this warped trajectory. And now I'm speeding up time to be able to show how it uh, will get close in to uh, the sun in the, in late May. And we've now fast forwarded sort of through the summer uh, to to see it hook around the sun, uh, and then eventually make its way back to the outer part of the solar system. Now, I wanted to show this trajectory because you can kind of see here, uh, and I'll note too that we're showing our little comet with a tiny tail. Um, it gets really close to the sun. And in fact, it's pretty close uh, to Earth's orbit as well. And when the comet was discovered toward the end of last year, this was considered very promising. We thought perhaps that comet uh, 2019Y4, we call it Comet Atlas for short because of the uh, the group that discovered it is the Atlas uh, group. And uh, we thought that this could be a very bright comet uh, that would become, uh, some people were even thinking visible during daylight hours uh, in the late summer or late spring of this year. As it turns out, uh, we've taken images of the comet uh, and I'm gonna just pop one of those up now. And uh, this is actually an image taken by Bing Clock, who's the assistant director of Morrison Planetarium. And you can see it's nicely labeled. It was taken using a unistellar telescope. And you can just barely see uh, this faint image of the comet in the field of view. And you might be able to see that it looks like it's starting to kind of break apart. And in fact, uh, just this morning, uh, the group at SETI Institute, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, which is based here in the Bay Area, 
uh, is the headquarters for a lot of the research that's being done with uh, unistellar telescopes. They're kind of an interesting technology that allows for a common platform uh, to be used by amateur and professional astronomers. And they made a coordinated effort to look at uh, Comet Atlas and, and activated 60 amateur astronomers around the world uh, to make observations and understand how this comet was breaking apart. So it's a really interesting time in astronomy where we have giant telescopes that are being built around the world, uh, launched into space, uh, but a lot of really interesting work can be done by relatively small telescopes here on the ground. I'm just gonna show one other image that shows this breakup of the comet nucleus more clearly. And so what you're seeing here, this is a close up of the comet and you can see that the nucleus uh, is broken up here. We can kind of see like four different, it's actually sort of a fifth piece here. And what's happened is the comet, just coming in from the outer part of the solar system is this icy rocky body. It's kind of like often called a dirty snowball. That's not a very accurate description in many ways, but that icy cold environment that it's accustomed to is being disrupted as it gets closer to the sun. It melts, it breaks apart, and it has fragmented. Now, if it had held together a little longer, it could have been the bright comet that we were expecting. Instead, because it's broken apart, uh, we are expecting that it will not be very bright, and it's already been dimming noticeably. So this was kind of a, a promising comet when we first found it, uh, but it's turning out to be less exciting as time goes on. However, it is interesting to watch this process as this object comes in from the outer solar system, and then as we're seeing it fragment break apart, uh, as it gets close to the sun. And I'll just mention briefly that this uh, image comes from I Igor uh, Smolish, who's an astronomer based in Serbia, and allowed us to share that image taken with a 1.5 meter telescope, kind of nice mid-sized telescope uh, in Serbia. So that's the story of our comet Atlas. And unfortunately, we were saying uh, the Planetarium team, maybe a comet alas is a better nickname for it. It turned out to be not so exciting. Uh, but again, interesting to see what happens when one of these objects from the outer solar system comes close to the sun. I'll just mention quickly too that uh, it's not just Comet Atlas that's kind of an interesting object to study. Uh, not one of the, I'm actually not gonna visit any planets in our presentation today. I hope that's not too disappointing, but I did wanna take you to visit a small asteroid that has been carefully studied uh, by a spacecraft, uh, the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft from uh, Japan. And uh, this asteroid is part of the asteroid belt. So just as a reminder, uh, this is the collection of tiny objects in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And it's kind of like a, a collection of objects that could have been a planet if it had a better experience in the early history of the solar system. Uh, so these fragments are intriguing little objects. And what's interesting is that they're kind of like leftovers from the early history of the solar system. So I want to take you in close to one, which is the uh, asteroid Ryugu. And this is a, um, a little kind of rubble pile that's only about a meter, I'm sorry, a kilometer. Oh, and we're watching it spin rather rapidly a little faster than I expected. Uh, that's because I was speeding up time to watch the um, uh, watch the uh, the comet make its trajectory around, uh, follow its trajectory around the sun. Uh, so we're slowed it down now and, um, and kind of showing some of the flaws here in the model. Uh, but as I said, this is a, uh, the asteroid Ryugu, which was explored by the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft. The spacecraft actually landed on this uh, uh, sort of kilometer sized, or sort of less than about six tenths of a mile across, weirdly shaped object. It's not, uh, we often talk about asteroids as being kind of potato shaped. Uh, this is more, almost looks from certain angles like a Dungeons and Dragons octahedral die or something. But this uh, model that we're seeing is actually based on observations from the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft. It made measurements of the size and uh, distribution of stuff on Ryugu's surface. And it also sent a couple probes down to collect samples. So the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft visited Ryugu uh, over the past couple of years. It left the asteroid behind uh, in um, November of last year. And now uh, Hayabusa 2 is on its way back to Earth uh, to return those samples for uh, for planetary scientists to study, to understand what uh, little Ryugu is made out of. 
And this is interesting because again, this is a tiny little object that's sort of left over from the formation of the solar system. So we study objects like this to kind of understand the history of how the planets formed and how our solar system took shape. I wanted to show this to you because I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the other uh, objects that are kind of scattered through the solar system. The asteroid belt was sort of the most famous collection of such objects. So Ryugu is a good example of a smallish, kind of mid-sized asteroid in the asteroid belt. But as we pull farther away uh, from the sun, we can actually see yet another collection of objects farther out uh, called the Kuiper belt. So these sort of brighter um, indicators that I'm, I'm showing now are the locations of a few thousand of these objects that have been discovered really over the past like 30 years. Um, the first of them is probably the most famous to be discovered, I should say. The first to be discovered is probably the most famous. That would be the planet, well, former planet, now dwarf planet, Pluto. Um, I've added its trajectory here, kind of crossing through our screen in a slightly different color. Uh, the dwarf planet Pluto is uh, was discovered back in the late, uh, back in 1930. And, and it was the only object that we knew in this part of the solar system uh, for many, many years. It wasn't until the 90s that we really started turning up more and more of these objects. And now we've gotten better and better at finding them. And so uh, the announcement that came from the observatory in Chile that I made a reference to earlier uh, showcased not, not just a few, but actually uh, more than 300 such objects, and at least a hundred, more than 100 of them are brand new. We did not, did not know about them previously. And this is uh, from a survey of this part of the sky uh, that was conducted over a period of four years. And it's actually called the Dark Energy Camera, the Dark Energy Survey. And it's looking for evidence of phenomena that took place that are shaping the, the, the history of the universe at a much larger scale that took place in many cases billions of years ago. But it turns out it's really good at finding stuff close to home. So uh, the dark energy survey picked up the locations of these hundreds of objects that we're now able to track as, uh, again, kind of fragments left over from the formation of our solar system. So an exciting discovery from our uh, uh, colleagues at the dark energy survey uh, down, in, uh, down in Chile. So here we are looking at our solar system, and this is a good launching off point now for the kind of bigger sense of scale of our universe. So uh, Pluto's orbit again is this outermost uh, trajectory of the dwarf planet Pluto. And um, I told you earlier that as we use light travel time as kind of a measuring rod, as a, a ruler in space, um, the distance between Earth and the moon is second and a half, that brief pause in conversation. Uh, eight minutes from Earth to the sun, a quick drink or a quick lunch, baby. And Pluto's orbit is actually a little over eight light hours across. So it takes about eight hours to travel from one side of Pluto's orbit to the other. And if you want to think about that in terms of a human scale, that's a good night's sleep. Now, the challenging thing is that the nearest star, which is relatively close by, is about four light years away. So if you think about the scale of our solar system compared to the interstellar distances that we're talking about, it's the difference between a good night's sleep and a high school or college education. Eight light hours versus four light years. So it's a radically different scale. And as we get farther and farther from home, this will become more and more of an issue. Uh, let me actually also just point out that um, a lot of the discoveries I'm going to be talking about at this point are really based on observations with telescopes. I already mentioned the telescope in Chile. Uh, those are observations by amateur astronomers using the Unistellar telescope to figure out the history and the, uh, the, the, the future of Comet Atlas. Um, but we have sent, of course, spacecraft like the Hayabusa spacecraft that traveled to the asteroid Ryugu and is now making the return trip home. We've also sent spacecraft out into space that are not coming home. And I'd like to highlight five of these fastest spacecraft uh, that have been launched out and are basically traveling at what we call escape velocity from the sun. They're traveling fast enough that the gravitational pull of the sun can't hold on to them anymore. These five spacecraft 
Four of them were actually launched back in the 70s. The, uh, the fifth was launched in the early aughts. Uh, Pioneer 10 here is traveling off kind of in a different direction. Uh, Pioneer uh, 11 and then Voyagers 1 and 2. Uh, those were all launched back in the 70s. And because we now know that the diameter of Pluto's orbit is about eight light hours, you can see that if we trace the trajectory of these spacecraft out, traveling farther and farther from the sun, none of them have traveled as far as light travels in a single day. So these are our fastest spacecraft. And this is how far they've traveled. So everything else we're gonna talk about we have learned by studying light from these much more distant objects, objects that are so far away that our spacecraft did not have nearly enough time to reach them. In fact, even if one of these spacecraft were headed toward Alpha Centauri, it would take about 10,000 years. Uh, sorry, Alpha Centauri being the closest star, four light years away, it would take 10,000 years for these uh, one of these spacecraft to make that trip that light makes in about four years. I'll just mention quickly that the fifth spacecraft is the New Horizons spacecraft. It's kind of, uh, its trajectory is sort of um, overlapping one of the Voyagers there. Uh, but this spacecraft rapidly shot out to visit uh, the dwarf planet Pluto. Uh, when New Horizons was launched, Pluto was actually still a planet. It was reclassified in 2006 as a dwarf planet. And so when New Horizons arrived, um, Pluto had been reclassified. Uh, but we learned very interesting things about Pluto, which again is one of these most the earliest discovered and one of these most interesting objects in the outer kind of Kuiper belt collection of objects that we looked at earlier. So with that, let's go ahead and leave our solar system behind. And this is where I kind of reveal that uh, we've been minimizing the brightness of the sun uh, to make it work well with our uh, collection of planets. And now we've brightened the sun to make it consistent with all of the other stars that we're illustrating in their appropriate locations in three dimensions. So as we were talking about before we started the digital portion of this pre presentation, um, this is a three-dimensional atlas of the universe. As we pull far enough away, uh, you'll see that these individual points are kind of moving past us. We are now vastly exceeding the speed of light. We're still orbiting the sun, but we're orbiting a three-dimensional digital model of the universe. And that us allows us to break the cosmic speed limit of the speed of light, and we can get a sense of the three-dimensional distribution of the stars around the sun. I'll just note in the distance here, this kind of gas cloud is the uh, large Magellanic cloud and the small Magellanic cloud. Those are both visible from the Southern hemisphere, for example, from Chile, excuse me, but, the, um, uh, but those are actually galaxies sort of in orbit around our own Milky Way galaxy. And now the band of the Milky Way is coming into view from the left-hand side of the screen. This is a collection of hundreds of billions of stars that kind of blur together to form this structure that we see in our night sky uh, that we've called the Milky Way. I'll get to more about the Milky Way in a moment, but before we leave this collection of stars behind, I wanna point out a couple things. First of all, there are many stars that we don't really see because they're simply too faint to be observed from Earth we need powerful telescopes to find them. And moreover, there are actual, actually little tiny, not quite stars, and I'm gonna have the computer help me steer our way toward one of those, that are fascinating objects in and of themselves. So I wanna visit a dwarf, uh, brown dwarf. Um, it has the rather unromantic name, 2 mass J1047-5385 plus 2124-234. Um, that's, 2 mass J1047 plus 21 for short. And it's a smallish object. We're kind of coming in at the sort of North Pole of the object, about the size of Jupiter, but much more massive. And it actually, sort of, we don't know what it looks like. So although we have we try to populate our digital model of the universe with as much data as possible, sometimes we indulge in a little artistic speculation. So what we're showing here is kind of a hypothetical appearance for this object. And we imagine that it might have, uh, we know that it has clouds. Uh, we know that it has bright spots and dark spots. And what we're seeing here in this structure of, uh, uh, of our dwarf, uh, of our brown dwarf is uh, an atmosphere that has is a little bit like the atmosphere of a planet like Jupiter, for example. But um, what astronomers are interested in is how fast might winds be traveling 
on the, on the upper atmosphere of this brown dwarf. And it turns out the way that, to figure this out is we can watch and tell how fast the, um, the clouds are moving because as the planet rotates, um, we see it brighten and dim as we're looking at brighter or dimmer parts of the planet. Uh, so we can do that using infrared light, light that's just a little bit beyond what our eyes can perceive. But we can also under look at what, um, but, but see that speed would be a combination of the rotation of the object, as well as the speed of the wind around the, uh, around the, the brown dwarf. And only by looking at now the magnetic field that's created by this brown dwarf, which um, is generated deep inside the object, can we compare the speed of that uh, because there are charged particles trapped inside the atmosphere of this brown dwarf, we can actually see uh, the rotation rate of that magnetic field, compare it to the rotation that we see in the atmosphere, and deduce that there are winds on this object that are traveling more than 2,000 kilometers per hour, about 1,500 miles per hour. So this kind of hurricane, in fact, vastly more than hurricane force winds on the surface of the brown dwarf are kind of a surprise. And uh, as we try to understand, brown dwarfs turn out to be very interesting because they're sort of like failed stars. They're uh, as I said, that object's about the size of Jupiter, uh, but uh, it uh, has a very different history uh, from the from the history of Jupiter as a planet forming around a star. Um, understanding things like this horribly or extraordinarily fast wind speed on the surface of the brown dwarf uh, is, a, is a great revelation and a great thing for astronomers to understand how these objects uh, take shape. So since we're far enough out from the sun too, I'll just mention as we see some of these stars drift by that in fact, um, uh, one of the uh, great discoveries that's been made in the last couple decades is that almost all of these stars, as far as we can tell, have planets in orbit around them. So I can actually highlight the stars that have planets in orbit around them. Uh, they're these little kind of, kind of garish little uh, three-dimensional markers. And I'm gonna sort of slow things down as we pull farther away from um, our location uh, near that brown dwarf, but that's actually relatively close to our own sun. And I'll just mention that uh, one of the things that we find so exciting about finding planets around other stars is that these are the places where we would hope life might uh, take root. So uh, planets are the location of, of where life might exist. So finding planets is uh, an encouraging sign that, uh, and particularly finding so many planets is an encouraging sign that uh, there are lots of places for life to exist. But it turns out that most of these thousands of planets are very different from Earth and actually very different from planets that we see in our own solar system. So although we found this really encouraging kind of diversity of planets, it's a little uh, daunting realizing that very few of them are what we consider to be like Earth. Now, just the other day, uh, there was an announcement of one uh, such planet that's very Earth-like uh, being discovered, but it's kind of, um, but it's gonna take a while to find really Earth-like planets amongst all of these thousands and to understand what the likelihood of life is on these distant objects. Before we leave this behind though, what I wanted to show uh, is sort of humanity's footprint in the universe around us. And I'm gonna illustrate that using what we call the radiosphere. Now, I showed you the trajectories of our fastest spacecraft, those five spacecraft that have traveled uh, less than light has traveled in a single day, zipping away from Earth fast enough to escape the sun's gravity. Those fastest nuts and bolts objects haven't traveled as far as light travels in a single day, but for decades now, for about 80 years, we have been emitting radio waves, a form of light, that travel very far out into the universe around us, relatively speaking. So this radio sphere is about 80 light years in radius. So the with the Earth sun the center, uh, light, the form of radio waves has had a chance to travel for 80 years. And I mentioned the SETI Institute, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute here in the Bay Area earlier. The origins of that institute, although it now studies a wide range of astronomical phenomena, the origins of that institute are in the search for radio signals from extraterrestrial intelligence. And if you could imagine if there were aliens on one of these planets uh, 
that are inside the radiosphere that were conducting a similar search, it's possible that they could have detected inside signs of technological uh, life uh, from Earth because there's, there's time for uh, a radio signal from Earth to reach their telescopes around some planet that's interior to the radiosphere. But if you think about it, the planets that are outside the radiosphere, even if there were intelligent radio astronomers with telescopes pointed back at Earth, they wouldn't see anything because the radio waves that we have emitted haven't had time to reach them. So that's why we can think of this radio sphere as kind of a our humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe around us. And I wanted to show you this because that will give a little bit more sense of scale to the next object that I wanted to talk about, our own galaxy, the Milky Way. I already mentioned the Milky Way's appearance from inside the galaxy, that hazy band of light that we call the Milky Way. But the Milky Way galaxy itself is a collection of hundreds of billions of stars that looks a little bit like this, we suspect. And this is based on observations of, uh, of where clusters of stars are and such in our galaxy, as well as observations of other galaxies that we, are, we think are similar to our own. Uh, but it is sort of an artist's representation. What I want to point out, though, is that we've got the scale pretty much right. And so that's our radio sphere. Again, a sphere 80 light years in radius, 160 light years across, that represents sort of our technological footprint in the universe around us. And yet, compared to the size of the Milky Way galaxy, it's pretty small. The galaxy itself, so from the upper left to the lower right, the galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. So it takes light about 100,000 years to travel from one side of the Milky Way to the other. If you think about it, 100,000 years ago, humans hadn't even left Africa. Our species was still on one continent here on planet Earth. And where we are, about 35,000 light years from the center of the galaxy, 35,000 years ago, we were painting the insides of caves. So now, if we use that light travel time, that measuring stick as a comparison, we started out with a second and a half of light travel time from Earth to the moon and vice versa. A brief pause in conversation, eight and a half minutes to the sun, four years, four light years to the nearest star. Those are all time scales that we can pretty well identify with, sort of human experience. But now we're talking about the existence of our species on the planet. So the distances are going to become more and more challenging to wrap our heads around. And now we've pulled far enough away that we're seeing our Milky Way galaxy uh, in context with other galaxies in the universe. So every point that we're seeing off in the distance isn't a star, but a collection of stars, a collection of hundreds of millions, hundreds of billions, perhaps even a trillion stars. Galaxies of various sizes all represented as individual points here in this representation of our kind of large scale structure of our universe. Now the Milky Way is part of a, what we call a local, local group of galaxies. There's about 50 galaxies uh, in our local group, but we are not in a particularly dense conglomeration of galaxies uh, relative to, uh, for example, the Virgo cluster, which is over here on the left. The Virgo cluster has about a thousand galaxies uh, that's all uh, uh, in a clump together, held together by the gravitational influence of one another. And that's a pretty dense collection of galaxies. So our local group uh, compared to the uh, Virgo cluster, it's kind of like comparing I don't know, something like Colma to downtown San Francisco. So we are not in the hubbub of activity. But the important thing to note here is that the galaxies are not kind of evenly distributed through space. Uh, and I'll also note that the galaxies are not all these different colors. This is a representation of color used to understand how galaxies clump and cluster together. So the astronomer Brent Tully, who provided these data sets, took the work of dozens of astronomers working over a period of decades, measuring distances to different galaxies. And he figured out which ones were kind of associated with one another and then color-coded them appropriately so that he could understand the relationships between all of these objects. So the color-coding is his, but 
the structure that you can see, the clumping and clustering of galaxies is very real. And it's a discovery that was about 40 years old. We now know that this clumping and clustering of galaxies occurs at much, much greater distances and much larger scales. And so as we pull even farther away, we're gonna fade up a couple extra data points. This is a collection of data that's been, if we've now automated this process of measuring distances to galaxies. And uh, here we're seeing that that clumping and clustering continues uh, out into this much larger data set. So instead of dozens of astronomers working over a period of decades to map this three-dimensional collection of galaxies relatively close to home, this uh, collection of galaxies that we're highlighting here has been uh, is, is data that's been collected by a couple instruments uh, working in a very automated fashion and mapping out the large scale structure of the universe in a very efficient way. A couple things to notice in addition to that clumping and clustering is that there are parts of the universe that don't seem to have many galaxies at all. And that's just because those are parts where, that we haven't yet mapped. And so what we're seeing is the limitation of uh, the degree to which we've mapped the universe around us. And before I leave this image behind, I just want to underscore that each one of these points is an individual galaxy. And I'm going to show an image that's a little bit more complex uh, to highlight a discovery from the past month. Uh, this is a remarkable observation of a single galaxy. And what's a little um, weird about this is that the galaxy is kind of down here in the center. The bright kind of streamers that you see emitted by the galaxy are actually coming from a black hole at the center of the galaxy. This is an observation made in radio wavelengths, similar but not quite exactly like the radio waves that we might emit through television and, uh, and other things that might be detected by alien civilizations. These radio waves are showing uh, lobes of hot gas emitted by uh, interactions around a black hole at the center of this galaxy. This is what we call an active galactic nuclei. This is one of the brightest objects in the southern hemisphere in radio wavelengths. And what's interesting is uh, this is one of the most high resolution images ever created of this phenomenon. And we're finding streamers of hot gas connected, uh, connecting these lobes of material that are being ejected by uh, the black hole at the center of the galaxy. And this is a huge surprise. Um, we've never had such high resolution images. This might be a common phenomenon, but we're just starting to explore the universe at this kind of scale. Uh, and we expect that these are actually electrons that are spinning around the uh, magnetic fields generated in this complex, weird environment. Again, driven by the energy of black hole at the center of this, of this galaxy, which is down here, kind of in the center of all this. So uh, this is an amazing um, discovery uh, that really is just sort of tantalizing in terms of thinking about what the future holds in terms of understanding these bizarre complex phenomena. And again, that's from one galaxy, effectively one point in uh, this collection of galaxies that we're showing here. So I'm gonna wrap up the program as with a kind of big picture view. So I wanna pull just a little bit farther out. And now that distance scale that I've been using for so long, uh, talking about light travel time as a yardstick that we can use to measure distances is really going to kind of uh, come together with a big punchline. Because now all of these dots again are, uh, are individual galaxies or some of the more distant ones are actually uh, bright cores of young galaxies, not too dissimilar from the uh, core of the, from the black hole driven uh, energy that's, that's, that I showed you earlier. But this background that I'm showing, kind of wrapping up everything, is the cosmic microwave background. And it's not an image quite like the images I've shown earlier. It's not an image quite like the image of the comet or the image of the even the radio uh, emissions from that galaxy. Instead, this is kind of like a heat map. The bright parts of this image correspond to hotter regions early in the history of the universe the dark parts correspond to cool regions. And this is a baby picture of the universe. As we understand it, the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. This image dates back to when the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old. So all of that structure that we see close to home, those clumps and clusters of galaxies, those 
were not yet, had not yet formed. And what we're seeing instead is the distribution of gas and the early history of the universe, which we then eventually pull together to form those clusters of galaxies that we see close to home. So this baby picture is showing us the origins of the structure that we see nearby. And what's fascinating is that the bright parts of this image are only about one part in a hundred thousand times brighter or hotter than the dark parts than the cool parts. And that variation, one part in a hundred thousand in terms of temperature corresponds to a tiny variation in density as well, about one part in a hundred thousand. Those bright parts are a little less dense. The dark parts are a little more dense. So the dark parts would evolve into the clusters of galaxies that we see today. The bright parts evolve into those kind of regions where we don't see many galaxies at all. So this baby picture tells us that first step, that first stage in the story of the evolution of our universe. And before I take us home, I just want to point out something uh, that is a little potentially confusing as we look at this uh, as we look at this uh, image. And this map, again, this is really a three-dimensional map of the universe around us. It looks like we are at the center of the universe. And it's a really tempting thought. I know lots of egomaniacal individuals who subscribe to similar kind of ideas. But in fact, we're not really at the center of the, of the, of the universe. We're at the center of this image because we are drawing the map. We're just charting the distance of these various objects uh, in terms of uh, their distance from us. And so we end up at the center because we're the ones drawing the picture. And just to emphasize that center is the here and the now. And farther out in space is farther back in time. So the galaxies that we're observing at great distances are in fact, were being observed as they were billions of years ago. And the punchline to that is this cosmic microwave background, which is billions of years in the past when the universe was young, unevolved and very, very different. So with that, let's go ahead and take a trip back home. So we'll pilot through those uh, bright galaxies uh, that have been cataloged by surveys that have automated this process of discovering uh, galaxies and measuring their distances. Uh, you can see that bright clump of red points, the Virgo cluster sort of disappearing to the upper left as we approach our own local group of galaxies. Again, each point in this image representing an individual collection of, of stars, an individual galaxy. Coming in close to home, we'll see our Milky Way galaxy, uh, the spiral galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars in it with a diameter of about 100,000 light years. And then in toward our radio sphere, that bubble of electromagnetic radiation that surrounds our location here on Earth at the sun, 80 light years in diameter, kind of our electromagnetic footprint in space, representing uh, the technological history of humankind uh, emanating out into the universe around us. And finally, coming in back close to our own sun, uh, as it dims to allow us to see the orbits of the planets inside, we can also see the trajectories of those five fastest spacecraft, um, four of which were launched back in the 1970s, making their way out into the universe around us. And finally, in toward our own third rock from the sun, planet Earth. And we can still see uh, the trajectory of the International Space Station uh, encircling our planet, the farthest humans physically travel out into the universe. But of course, as we've already seen in just the past several minutes, uh, we can travel much farther using our many, many tools of astronomy and our imaginations. So I want to thank you for joining me in this uh, streamed version of our universe update tour of the universe. And I'd be delighted to answer any questions uh, that you might have about this or any other uh, astronomical topic that comes to mind. Ryan, thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Do you think that studying things at this scale makes you more or less susceptible to middle of the night existential dread? <laughs> Um, well, you know, as I said, I was exposed early at age seven. So I <laughs> um, but have you shaken it? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I think what's amazing is that we figured it out. I think that's what's so cool is that even though, you know, our monkey brains evolved to deal with very different situations here on Earth, we're able to like look out into the universe and figure out, put this together, piece together these puzzle pieces in a really interesting way. So. Yeah.
Uh, well, we do have questions. Um, Great. I'll start with Mojita who asked, um, are planets, are planet orbits all in the same plane or is that just the representation we're seeing in this case? Uh, so, and actually I'll go ahead and well, um, we could do one or two things. I could put up the imagery from the, uh, sure. from the software again, and I can underscore that in fact, the, uh, the orbits of the planets are all in the same plane. Let me go ahead and take away our spacecraft there. Um, and that's, that's real. Um, those again are the, the, the sort of heavy, the big players in the solar system, the planets. Now notice actually, as we orbit around the solar system, Pluto, this sort of differently colored orbit, Pluto actually is a little bit, goes a little bit above and below the plane of the galaxy, of the, of the solar system. Um, and, and if we looked at those, those Kuiper belt objects, uh, those similarly um, showed a distribution sort of above and below the plane. We'll see that as we kind of rotate around here. Um, but the really massive stuff, most of the matter in the solar system is very much confined to this very thin plane. And that's because as the solar system formed, and uh, the comparison is actually kind of mundane. It's if you can, if you've ever seen someone tossing pizza dough, as it spins, it flattens out into the, the, the pizza crust. And that's exactly what happened early in the history of the solar system. As stuff rotated, uh, uh, revolved around the sun, that mass uh, flattened out, and most of the mass of the solar system ends up in this, this tight plane. Lighter weight stuff, is more easily kind of kicked around, scattered. And so uh, mm -hmm. these small objects end up a little bit more above and below the plane, but still following kind of that general um, planar uh, distribution. And the same is true of our galaxy uh, and, and, uh, and, and other objects that we see in the, in the universe around us. Oh, okay. Um, so we talked a little bit about the software that you're using um, in the beginning of this broadcast, but Morgan asked, uh, I get he came in later in the broadcast and I thought I'd reprise it just for people that join later. What software is this? Can we run this on same simulation? And I know you mentioned it was kind of a bespoke thing used by planetariums. Other people responding to him mentioned things like Celestia. So yeah, Celestia is a, is a cool piece of software. This software is called Uniview, U-N-I-V-I-E-W. Uh, it, um, it's currently um, released by a, the Zeiss company, which is a, the originator and original inventor of the planetarium. Um, but it doesn't have a sort of commercial version for, for download that, that everyone can just uh, use and play with. There are a couple other, in addition to Celestia, there are a couple other software platforms that are to varying degrees easy to use. Uh, Open Space is probably the biggest effort right now to uh, replicate kind of the functionality that we saw uh, today. Uh, we use Open Space in Morrison Planetarium. It, I haven't got it quite behaving on my laptop yet, um, but that's open source. It's not the, it's a little bit of a learning curve. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you go to openspaceproject.org or com, I forget which, um, you'll be able to download it and it runs on both uh, Mac OS and Windows. So it's pretty easy to, to get into. Cool, okay, great, thanks. Uh, Steve says, I remember a lot of talk for a while about possibly mining comments. Is this idea still discussed or useful for any reason? Uh, there is still some discussion. And uh, I mean, I, I mean People like to talk, and uh, and uh, there's also ideas about about um, going to the moon for resources. And in fact, there was a recent uh, announcement by the uh, by the White House saying that that we would be uh, looking at the moon as a source of, of uh, commercial exploitation, which is a very fruitful topic for discussion. Uh, asteroids um, could be and and comets, maybe to a lesser degree, could be really interesting places to to look for different kinds of materials. Um, asteroids are probably a little bit more promising because for the most part, they orbit in uh, a little bit closer into or orbits similar to Earth, so they're easier to get to and back from. Comets tend to be coming from the outer solar system a little bit harder to catch hold of. Mm -hmm. um, so so um, we don't learn about them as, as far in advance. Uh, so for example, that comet Atlas I mentioned, we only discovered it back in December. Um, and now it's kind of whipping through the solar system and it'll be gone by the end of the year. Whereas asteroids are following orbits that are a little more um, conducive to going and visiting and potentially mining them. I see. Okay. Uh, let's see, Cheryl asked, how far can each type of observatory see or detect objects, optical versus radio versus microwave, for example? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there are 
um, a variety of telescopes in a variety of wavelengths. So I mentioned mostly um, the visible wavelengths, so the observations of the um, of the Kuiper Belt objects. Those hundreds of new objects that were discovered were were made in visible wavelengths. But interestingly, that telescope and that project was designed to look for uh, evidence of dark energy, which is operating on the largest scales, very far away from home. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the, the tools that you want to use to do that kind of bigger, that, that more explicit project are also good for finding objects like this. So it's designed for something to look very far away from home, but it's finding stuff relatively close to home. And so the limitation is really about the sensitivity of the, um, of the telescope and how much other stuff interferes. So um, radio waves get a lot of interference from our galaxy. Microwaves also get a lot of interference from our galaxy. So if we're looking inside the plane of the galaxy, we don't see much. But if we look outside the plane, we can make detections. So it kind of depends on where you're looking and uh, how sensitive the instrument is. But we can observe um, anything that's bright enough uh, that we have an unobstructed line of sight to. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you talk about how sensitive something is, is that is that like, you know, it's it's one thing to be able to see that something's there and it's another to be able to get any useful insights from it. Yeah. Is that sort of what the sensitivity is about? Well, so the sensitivity is kind of, it's a, um, it's a, it's, it lumps together a lot of ideas. So, um, so for example, the Hubble Space Telescope is not a particularly big telescope. There are much larger telescopes on Earth, but it's in space. So it, um, it has a sensitivity and resolution that is not accessible to most telescopes on Earth um, because it is um, not inside Earth's obscuring atmosphere. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of use sensitivity as sort of lumping together a lot of different uh, phenomena from resolution to light gathering power. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, I, had, I like this one from Chrissy. What discovery have you been most excited by in the last five years? Uh, oh, five years, wow. You can go 10 if you want, or you can go one, whatever seems well, so, like. Um, so uh, I think the, the biggest, um, like, and it's not even one discovery so much as like, it's uh, it's just the biggest story, I think, in astronomy from the last couple of years is uh, the Gaia spacecraft. So the Gaia um, mission has observed literally uh, more than a billion stars. And it's not able, uh, able to just to look at their brightness uh, and in their color. It's also looking at how quickly they're moving uh, across the sky and in many cases uh, toward or away from us. It is an incredibly rich collection of data. And we're only beginning to tease out uh, all of the things that we can learn from Gaia. So it's already showing us um, about the history of our, uh, our galaxy and how our galaxy has taken shape. Uh, it's telling us about um, uh, the story of how stars form. It's just an incredibly rich and amazing uh, collection of data and we're going to continue to learn from that probably for decades so that's uh so the gaia spacecraft is probably my big uh, cool. most exciting stuff cool um so kelly says i feel a little dumb for not being sure about this but have we or have we not found evidence of any kind of life in any form on any other planet <laughs> so uh, short answer is no we have not found any uh evidence for life elsewhere um and, uh, and in fact, this is the topic of a, of a planetarium show that we're working on right now that will premiere, premiere next year. Okay. And that's really looking at, um, it's a complex question. Uh, mm -hmm. We could, for example, go to the planet Mars, uh, collect samples and potentially find evidence of life. That's one uh, kind of route to discovery relatively close to home. Or we could make observations of a planet, uh, one of the exoplanets that I showed earlier a planet much, much farther away outside our solar system. And we're it's a hot topic in astronomy right now. Like what is an observation that we could make that would be conclusive to tell us right. that it exists there? And it's a really tricky question. And the best, easiest way is if we get um, something like, you know, Carl Sagan's contact and an extraterrestrial civilization just reaches out to us yeah. <laughs> with an un <laughs> unambiguous signal. But we've been looking for that for a few decades and we haven't found that either. So yeah. Yeah, time will tell, but nothing yet. But we'd like them to be kind of vaguely humanoid and like not super yeah. to the eyes and like. Exactly. Okay. They're good for science fiction stories. Of yeah. <laughs> um, 
Let's see. Oh, so Steve asked, um, can you briefly, and I'll just do like three more. Um, thanks for staying with us. Oh, absolutely. Asked, can you briefly explain how the microwave background radiation image was mapped? Sure. So this kind of goes to Cheryl's question about the uh, sensitivity of different instruments. So it turns out that microwaves are, um, the, the galaxy emits lots of microwave radiation. So you actually have to weed all of that out. And the key is not to look just at one wavelength, but to look at a whole range of wavelengths. And so um, things that are emitting energy, things of a certain temperature that are emitting energy in various wavelengths have a very characteristic curve of uh, intensity of that radiation versus wavelength. And so we know what that looks like. And that helps us tease out um, what uh, what we're seeing in terms of the microwave radiation, because what I was showing you, that modeled kind of microwave background, is actually the variation from that very strict, well understood curve. So the that map is a variation in temperature rather than uh, sort of the overall temperature of the object, of of this stuff billions of light years away. So um, so the the key thing is it's not looking at just one single wavelength of light, but a whole range of wavelengths. And then it requires understanding a little bit about how um, the, the universe works in terms of how it, uh, things emit light to be able to then tease apart what we're seeing for that particular image. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, Bryn, from Bryn, <clears throat> what is the coolest thing about having this job? <laughs> well, I do think that, um, interacting with astronomers to bring their data into this system has been uh, remarkably rewarding. It's something that I've had the chance to do for almost 20 years now. And uh, actually more than that in certain ways. But what's really cool right now is that we have just started to get the attention of research astronomers and potentially other researchers as well, maybe not just limited to astronomy, in how we can use planetarium domes as research tools. So all of the stuff that I showed you uh, is integrated into this three-dimensional atlas of the universe. We can ingest new data, including, for example, the Gaia data that I mentioned earlier. And we can study it in ways, in a planetarium dome specifically, in ways that you just can't experience it uh, in other environments. And so it's kind of an extension, if you really want to geek out about computer technology, of the caves, which were environments where researchers would collaborate back in the 90s. Uh, but you have to wear funny glasses, and, and you can only fit two or three people in the space at one time. Imagine now we can bring 20 or 30 astronomers into a planetarium dome. We can show them their data and we can look for patterns and, and things that would not have been possible even a couple of years ago. And what's interesting too, we're working in a place like California Academy of Sciences with an emphasis on a range of sciences is that I think we can do that with a lot of other data as well. So that's what's the most exciting to me right now is how all of these tools can support research and in increasing our understanding and discovery. Cool, and I just wrote down caves research because I have to go yeah. there later because yeah. I don't know what that's about, but it sounds like worth Googling. Um, okay, cool. And this is a, this is a softball to end with, but I, I like it. It's from Dan. Um, what resources would you recommend for finding out what the average person can see in the night sky at any given time? And that made me remember that we should mention that Morrison Planetarium actually puts out a star guide or sky guide every year, and we'll drop the link for that into comments. Uh, but anything else for folks at home? Yeah, so the, um, and actually next week is uh, uh, the our Dark Sky Week, so a celebration of dark skies uh, around the world. And we're going to be sharing on the Morrison Planetarium Facebook page a lot of things that you can look for in the night sky. Um, our, um, our annual um, almanac is a great place to start. It talks about some of the, the kind of big events that are coming up through the course of the year. So yeah, we can share a link to that. Uh, but then there are some really great resources. Uh, I, the first one that comes to mind is earthsky.org, just um, earthsky, all one word, .org. It does share quite a bit of things that you can look for. And it's a whole range of, of it's got astronomy news. It's also got um, things you can look for in the night sky. And then if you have binoculars or telescope, it has ideas for that as well. So that's one of my, I have to admit, one of my favorite sites. Awesome, perfect. And I, I think we should announce the important news that you've agreed to come back and do another one of these next month. Absolutely. So this is a program that I do every month in the planetarium. And uh, and so I'm really happy to bring it to uh, our streaming uh, virtual uh, space yeah. uh, however we can. Yeah. And we had some Benjamin Dean lecture fans watching. So I feel like we should maybe talk about what we can do with those online too. Yes. Uh, 
It's yeah. Hope. Okay, great. So, um, so yeah, thank you so much again for doing this. We can't wait to have you back. Thank and you. I'll yeah. just say um, to everyone watching, thank you as well. We so appreciate you tuning in over and over. And do come back Monday at 10 a.m. We're going to have Dr. Rebecca Albright, who's part of our Hope for Reach initiative and has built one of the only coral spawning labs in the world at the Academy. We're actually expecting like 100,000 coral babies any day now, which is cool. So we might have some more updates on that when she um, speaks Monday. So join us then and check the schedule for when Ryan will be back with us again. Have a wonderful weekend and thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, Ryan. Take care.